Okay. Uh, testing. Can you all hear me? Just a nod or a, a thumbs up. That will be good. Okay, great. Uh, good morning to everyone here. Merhaba. Uh, my name is Johan. I'm from the Singapore Business Federation. Uh, here today we are here to learn more about uh, the Turkish, sorry, the Turkey Singapore uh, Free Trade Agreement, also known as the TRSFTA. So uh, let's go through a quick run on the program we have today. We have our colleagues from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Uh, Ms. Denise Pereira, as well as Ms. Jalisa, who will be going through the overview of the TRSFTA. After that, we have my colleague, uh, Ms. Rahimi, from the SBF as well, who will be talking about the trade in goods chapter, uh, rules of origin of the TRSFTA, as well as the operational certification procedure, all of which are crucial to successfully using the TRSFTA. So it's a bit heavy on that side. And then lastly, we have Ian from SBF who will be moderating a panel discussion between Mr. Cem Karchi as well as uh, Mr. Amre Buyu Kelec, uh, who will be talking about the business climate of Turkey. So uh, without further ado, let's just welcome Ms. Pereira and Ms. Jalisa to uh, present their segment. Uh, Ms. Pereira, Ms. Jalisa, please. <clears throat> I'm so sorry about that. Thank you so much, um, everyone. Yeah, I see some nods, so I'm assuming audio is good. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here today. Um, just by a quick uh, way of introduction, I'm Denise Pereira. I'm from Singapore's Ministry of Trade and Industry, or MTI. And uh, I oversee the Central Asia Division in MTI. And this includes, uh, in our portfolio, it includes uh, Turkey. Um, together with my team, what we do is we oversee the economic relations between Singapore and Turkey. Um, and with me here this morning, uh, Singapore time morning, is uh, Jalisa Lim, who is from my team. And she will be going into some detail on the, the free trade agreement that um, our two countries have, uh, the free trade agreement, FTA between Turkey and Singapore, so TRS, FTA. Um, she'll be looking a little bit into the services and investment components of the FTA, and then our colleagues from the Singapore Business Federation will go into the goods portion of the FTA. Um, but before, before we start on the technical details, or the specific details, I thought it would be good to give a very brief overview on the relationship, the economic relationship between uh, Singapore and Turkey. Um, you will see, I think, let me see where the slides are. On this slide, we have given you some figures, some trade and investment figures. Yeah, um, I think uh, uh, the details of it, um, you know, uh, feel free to read and we'll circulate the slides as well. Uh, but what I thought was important to note, um, our goods trade with uh, Turkey, Singapore, Turkey, goods trade, services trade and investment, uh, or at least the, the presence of companies in each other's markets. Um, they are, you will see from this slide, the figures are relatively small. Um, but what we have been quite heartened by is that trade in goods, services and investments have been increasing um, over the years. Uh, last year, um, you will see that our goods trade amounted to just over $2 billion. And um, it's a, again, I say it's a small figure, but there has been an average growth of about 7% uh, a year from the time our FTA came into force in 2017. And similarly, our services trade, which was just above a billion dollars uh, in 2021, actually saw a 46% increase from the previous year. Uh, and we have seen the presence of Singapore companies in Turkey and Turkish companies in Singapore also growing. Um, so we are very heartened to see that there is an upward trend, uh, but we do recognize that there is scope to increase uh, these figures, these relationships further. And um, in this regard, we hope actually firstly to be able to increase the awareness uh, among businesses of the potential opportunities uh, in our respective markets, in the Singapore market for Turkish companies and in Turkey for Singapore companies. And uh, secondly, uh, we were hoping also that the FTA can be an enabler uh, for more business interactions and for more trade flows. 
And uh, this, I think, is uh, really provides the, the background, the backdrop and the context to why we are holding this webinar and um, to have a gauge as well of the interest from business and what we can do uh, going forward in terms of whether it's more webinars, whether it's more um, very specific um, assistance that we can give each other uh, to, to explore the opportunities in, in the Turkey market. Um, so that's just a brief uh, brief uh, overview of the actual relationship, the trade in terms of trade and investment figures. Uh, in the next slide, which I think is uh, is a uh, quite uh, an interesting one, is um, where we've identified some areas of opportunity um, in Turkey. And I think many of you who've been doing business already there or have interest in doing so, you already have your assessments, your relationships, your visits and would have first-hand experience on what the opportunities could be. And I'm very happy to be listening in on the second part of this webinar where we can hear some of uh, those experiences with regard to the business um, landscape and opportunities. Um, so the areas we've listed here are really very, um, uh, what, what we have identified as just some of the possibilities. Of course, this is not uh, exhaustive. Um, for myself and my team, we have been taking some trips uh, to Turkey for in the past few years. I've been on this file for about four years now. And in 2019, when I first joined the file, um, I took my first trip to Istanbul and Ankara with uh, our minister, Minister Iswaran. Um, that was in 2019. And we were actually very heartened to see that there were several Singapore companies operating successfully in Turkey. Eh? And they spent several sectors, uh, hospitality, for example, agriculture, trade, port development, financial services, e-commerce even. Um, and even though we found in 2019 that there were some economic uncertainties, the lira was not doing so well at the time, um, but yet our companies were thriving um, there. And uh, we we assessed it and we you know talked to them and, and consulted uh, the respective parties and found that um, actually Turkey is a very large and vibrant uh, domestic market. Uh, and that made for uh, for good business for our companies. And also, very importantly, um, like Singapore, Turkey occupies a very good location uh, in this world because of the proximity and connectivity to the areas around. Uh, so to Europe, for example, to the EU, to the Middle East, Asia, Africa. Uh, so this really broadened opportunities and markets uh, for the companies that were based in, in Turkey. Uh, so we were quite happy to hear this and to hear that the are indeed opportunities going forward. Um, the next work trip I took actually was last year. Uh, there were, the, of course, the two COVID years that, that travel was, uh, you know, didn't, didn't really happen. So last year, we did some working level trips with my team, with Enterprise Singapore as well. And uh, again, we were quite heartened to see that the domestic economy in Turkey continued to be very vibrant. Um, the Singapore companies we met in 2019 were still there, still doing well. And we saw an addition, actually, of new companies that were collaborating with the Turkish companies to provide digital solutions, technology solutions uh, to enhance uh, the existing business, um, changing business models and doing well together. So we were very happy to see this and we want this to actually grow. Um, overall, we found, of course, there's scope to do a lot more with Turkey. Uh, first, uh, there's a large population, as I mentioned, 85 million people. Beyond this, again, large markets around um, the country. Uh, there is also a growing demand for consumer goods. We found that consumer spending accounted for about 60% of Turkey's GDP, um, increasing demand for certain products like electronics, food products, um, financial services, e-commerce. Uh, we saw that Turkey had a growing technology industry, vibrant startup ecosystem, um, it's attractive uh, investment incentives in, in certain sectors as well, including technology. Uh, some of uh, Turkey's most funded tech verticals were things like grocery services, uh, AI, software as a service, uh, gaming. Uh, so new opportunities coming up. Um, since 2020, Turkey has been home to six unicorns, all of which are in the technology sector. And uh, Singapore companies, as I mentioned, have formed very good partnerships uh, with the Turkish companies in the tech industry. Um, and we, we do have some examples of, of some of those partnerships. Um, so very good to see that. Uh, we've also noticed that the Turkish government has been focusing on digitalization efforts. Um, so there's a higher demand now for digital solutions like digital trade solutions, ed tech, education technology, med tech, medical, uh, agriculture, ag tech, uh, urban solutions, uh, smart city development. 
Um, and we know now that with the elections uh, just over and um, uh, knowing that there's some stability there, we know that some of these initiatives would, uh, would continue. Uh, going forward. So that's some, some areas of opportunity as well. Uh, other industry-specific sectors uh, include healthcare, agriculture. Uh, healthcare products are among Singapore's leading exports to Turkey since 2019, and this continues to, to see strong and sustained growth. Um, agriculture is up and coming. Um, Turkish companies are looking to diversify their current uh, market beyond Europe to look at Southeast Asia, for example. And actually, this ties in very nicely with Singapore's own efforts to diversify our sources of food supply, uh, which is an important aspect of our economic resilience. Um, and if we can also be a hub, of course, to the rest of Southeast Asia, I think in the other direction, where we also use our working visits to Turkey to raise awareness of Singapore so that Turkish business will be aware of opportunities here, um, both in Singapore as a market and as a hub to the Southeast Asian region. Um, and what we want to do, of course, is to grow business links between the Singapore companies, Turkish companies, and hope that a lot more partnerships can be catalyzed. Um, so, yeah, there is a very quick and, and, and fast brief overview, and I thought good to give this background context uh, before we delve into the actual FDA itself. Um, we see the FDA as an enabler to enhance business links and trade flows. Um, so, and we we don't only look at the FDA in terms of the benefit, the technical benefits, which we will go into in a bit, um, on tariff savings, for example, uh, tariff reduction or elimination, zero percent tariff when we export from Singapore to Turkey. We also look at things like services regulations being eased, uh, investment regulations being uh, eased for facilitated business, um, but also. Um, where the FDA is concerned, we do have enhanced institutional linkages, for example, between the government agencies and the relevant parties of Singapore and Turkey. And we, we think that this is something that's also extremely useful for business because then we have touch points and contact points with each other to resolve um, issues that ever uh, arise and come up. Uh, so just to give you that very broad background context and happy to answer questions uh, later on in this webinar or even after, uh, you know, where we can follow up. Um, after this session. Um, so yeah, I, I'll stop here. I think I, I went into quite a bit um, and hand over the floor now to my teammate, Jalisa, who will go a little bit into the FDA proper itself, the services and investment components. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Denise. So I'll be bringing you through how the TRS FDA can facilitate your business interests in Turkey and Turkish interest businesses, uh, Turkish businesses interests in Singapore. So to provide like a brief overview, the TRS FTA is a comprehensive FTA with 18 chapters featuring more traditional chapters such as goods, services, investment, government procurement, and intellectual property rights, and more up and coming market trends covering e-commerce, as you can see um, in the slide towards the right. So I'll provide a brief overview on the benefits and key highlights in the goods, services, and investment chapters before going more detail into this afterwards. For the goods chapter, the, our TIG chapter has a 10-year staged tariff elimination period. This means that uh, Turkey will progressively eliminate customs duties on 95% of Singapore's originating imports 10 years from when the FTA came into force. As it came into force in 2017, this means that it will, that uh, the 95% tariff elimination will be complete by 2027. So similarly, Singapore remo will remove tariffs on alcohol and other dutiable goods from items coming in from Tukie. So beyond tariff elimination, the TRS FTA also provides uh, zero tariffs on two special baskets of goods. The first one is uh, certain Asian food products that include wax sausages, fish balls, canned luncheon meat, select surimi products, and more items. And the other basket covers um, Singapore's exports to Tukie on select products for use in civil aircraft under end use provisions. So businesses that are keen to venture into the food retailing sector in Tukie can reach out to MTI after this presentation if you have any questions relating to the Asian food products. We can share the full list of these products during the Q&A session or you could always drop us an email afterwards to find out more. So beyond uh, tariff elimination, the TRS FTA also provides another benefit, which is the self-certification regime that can help reduce administrative costs in exporting goods into each other's markets. 
So how this works is that businesses can simply declare the country of origin for their products on commercial documents, like your invoices and delivery or orders, without having to uh, apply for an authorized certificate of origins with Singapore Customs, which I understand can be a bit complex and take some, some time to, to explore and file. So my colleague Rahini from SBF will share more information about the operationalization of the trade and goods chapter and the rules of origin chapter after our presentation. Moving on, the services chapter covers four modes of supply. So the first is cross-border trade, the second is consumption abroad, the third is commercial presence, and the fourth is the movement of natural persons, which covers business persons and intra corporate transferees. Some of you who are familiar with FTAs know that the, the modes ones and twos uh, of supply are usually already covered in the WTO, which means that uh, other, other countries where we don't have an FTA with can also have access to these. But modes three and four are the new areas covered by the FTA. So under modes three and four, uh, Singapore companies can set up a subsidiary office in Turkey and Singapore service suppliers can enter into Turkey on a temporary basis to provide their services. For example, um, a business sending a consultant to Turkey or to Singapore to follow up on the service provided. So what our services chapter aims to do is to build a more predictable environment for service suppliers to a range of provisions, such as a national treatment, which ensures that Singapore service suppliers will be treated equally as a Turkish service suppliers across both our markets in the areas where our commitments are undertaken. It also provides enhanced market access in areas such as um, the business sector, construction, and retail services sectors, which Denise has explained has been growing in popularity these days um, in the joint partnerships between Turkish and Singapore companies. These are advantages that Turkey's other trading partners may not be able to enjoy if they do not have an FTA with them. So the, as for the investment chapter, it seeks to lower the barriers of entry for Singapore investors in Turkey and vice versa by ensuring fair and equitable treatment, access to due processes and due diligence. So the investment chapter can be broadly understood in two, in two parts. The first covers uh, clauses that seek to promote greater flows of FDI between our countries, which uh, as Denise has mentioned at the beginning of the presentation has begun to slowly grow after the FDA came into force. and um, the other part of the investment chapter provides protection for investments through, for example, um, recourse to from for expropriation and international investor state dispute settlement. So together, these enable a more transparent and secure environment for our companies. So I'll be going through the services chapter briefly and talking about what kind of clauses can be found in our in the TRS FTA services chapter. So the, the services chapter provides market enhanced market access across committed sectors by removing barriers to trade in the provision of services. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there are four modes of supply covered under the TRS FTA. And to briefly explain, um, the first mode is cross-border supply, which covers the provision of services across borders. For example, with an advertising firm providing consultancy services online. So the second mode is consumption abroad, when a service is consumed in a supplier's market. For instance, when the advertising firm sends their billboards across to Turkey. So these two modes of services are already covered under the WTO as explained earlier. And the real advantage of the TRS FDA comes in the third and fourth uh, modes of supply. So the third mode of supply is commercial presence, when a service supplier is a locally established affiliate, a subsidiary, or a representative office. And the fourth mode is the movement of natural persons, where a Singapore supplier can enter into the Turkish market and vice versa on a temporary basis to provide their services. So beyond the form, I mean, beyond covering four modes of supply, the FTA services chapter also aims to remove barriers to trade through including clauses such as national treatment, local presence, and domestic regulation. I think some of you may already be familiar with these, but I will just go through them very briefly. So under the National Treatment Clause, both Singapore and Turkey are obliged to provide foreign service suppliers with the same treatment as local service suppliers um, in the commitments where the FTA undertake, in the, sorry, in the sectors where the FTA's commitments are undertaken in order to create a fairer playing field for all businesses in each other's markets. And uh, under the Local pr Presence Clause, Singapore and Turkey's service suppliers are not required to be a resident 
nor are they required to establish or maintain a representative office when providing their services in each other's markets. And lastly, under the domestic regulation clause, Singapore and Turkey are committed towards ensuring that measures affecting trade and services are to be administered in an objective and impartial manner. So this aims to provide some sort of stability when venturing into each other's markets. So I would just like to, like to highlight that uh, one of the key uh, specialties of this services chapter is that it follows a negative list approach. So this means that uh, all sub sectors and subsectors are actually covered under the FTA and receive enhanced market access and of course access to these clauses unless uh, it is otherwise stated in the party's list of non-conforming measures. So just, just to bring you through, some of these sectors with enhanced market access include the business sectors, the construction sectors, uh, construction services sectors, the communication services sectors, educational sectors, which financial sectors and transport sectors, which Denise has said are all very up and coming in Turkey, where there is a very vibrant market there and lots of opportunities for businesses there. So as with the other FTAs that adopt a negative list approach, the sectors where there are where restrictions are placed can be found in the non-conforming measures list. So this exhaustive list can be found on Enterprise SG's website where we have uploaded the legal text of the FTA, but you can always ask us more about this more information about this at, during the QAA session after the presentation. So I'll briefly explain the benefits of the investment chapter in the next slide. So the TRS FTA's investment chapter seeks to encourage greater flows of FDI through investment promotion and investment protection provisions. And the purpose of these provisions is to build a more transparent and stable investment environment for both Singapore and Turkish businesses. This is done through granting fair and equitable treatment to investors and undertaking commitments that prevent parties from engaging in discriminatory practices, providing avenues for recourse when there is expropriation and liberalizing transfers of payments. So some of the clauses that serve this function are the National Treatment Clause, <clears throat> the Most Favoured Nation Treatment Clause, prohibi prohibition of performance requirements, protection against expropriation, compensation for losses, and um, access to international investor state dispute settlement. So of note, the national treatment provision ensures that Singapore investors and their investments will be given the same level of treatment as locals in the Turkish markets under the committed sectors that I brought you through in the previous slide after the investment is established in the whole state and vice versa for Turkish companies in Singapore as well. So in this way, it aims to create a more level playing field between the Singapore and Turkish investors in our respective markets. So the most favoured nation uh, treatment or MFN clause is another highlight of the investment chapter that is not always present in Turkey's or Singapore's other FTA. So it is rather comprehensive in this aspect. And the MFN introduces comparative treatment where Singapore investors and their investments will be accorded the same treatment as any other foreign investor in the Turkish market under like or comparable circumstances. So the MFN clause provides Singapore inv investors and Turkish investors, of course, with the assurance that they will not be disadvantaged compared to other foreign investors in our markets, such as those hailing from our major trading partners and other third markets within our region. Um, beyond these, the TRS FTA also provides a number of investment protection provisions, such as uh, protection against expropriation, um, compensation for losses, and uh, recourse to ISDS. So, how will this? How, how does this uh, translate into benefits? How how is this illustrated? How can a Singapore company tap onto these? So we've done up a case study to show how a Singapore service provider that establishes a subsidiary in Turkey can benefit in a number of ways. So firstly, under the services chapter, this Singapore company is not required to be a resident or maintain a representative office in Turkey to provide their services. They will also enjoy enhanced market access in committed sectors such as the financial, business, construction, and retail services sectors, just to name a few, which are not provided to non-FTA partners. So the list of liberalized sectors covers everything except for those listed in the non-conforming measures of the FTA, which uh, we have explained earlier. And one of the key highlights of the services sector is actually the coverage of new financial services. 
where financial services that are new to the market would be accorded the benefits covered under the FTA in like circumstances, provided that the supply of the new service does not require new law or modification of an existing law. And uh, new financial services is, uh, is quite liberal because we don't see it in all of Singapore's or Turkey's FTA, so it is uh, an added benefit that is not present in our other FTAs. So secondly, under the investment chapters, uh, companies do not face restrictions on the transfer of payments or capital and can enjoy investment protection benefits and have access to avenues for recourse in the event the actions taken by our, our respective states affect the investment. So in addition to the benefits under the FTA, companies can also tap onto our other trade architecture that uh, Singapore has with Turkey, such as our avoidance of double tax agreement, which provides for the exemption or reduction of tax on various types of income derived. So this includes a reduction of source country tax on dividends, interest, and loyalties. So uh, I'll very happily share that uh, there's been one thing, there has been a few Singapore companies that have successfully established themselves in Turkey after the TRS FDA came to force. And one of these is a DTO, DT1, which is a B2B digital micropayments platform. So in 2021, DT1 partnered up with a Turkish financial institution to launch Turkey's, Turkey's first international airtime and data transfer service. So for the very first time in Turkey, foreigners living and working in Turkey were able to send airtime and data back to their families, back home to their families with UPT and DT1's global money transfer and payment platform. So this is an example of one of the financial sectors liberalized under the TRS FTA and how companies have taken advantage of it. So what's coming next? Like what are some of MTI's plans in enhancing our G2G relations and facilitating our commercial interests between our countries? So as a next step, uh, MTI will be holding more business outreach sessions to gather feedback on the challenges that businesses face in utilizing the TRS FTA with a view of uh, improving our implementation issues. So we'll also be holding G2G consultations to explore expanding food trade between our countries through the certain Asian uh, food products, uh, through the zero tariffs on the certain Asian food products in the goods chapter of the TRS FTA. And we'll also engage in dialogues to promote the import and distribution of these products uh, between our markets. So we've created a Google form to collect your feedback on the TRS FTA and some of the challenges that uh, businesses are currently facing in engaging with each other's markets. And uh, this Google form be circulated after the presentation by SBF. So that comes to the end of our, our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Denise. Thank you, Ms. Jalisa. Certainly a lot to take in, but uh, no worries. Uh, for those who have any questions, you may just drop the questions in the Q&A box and we will get back to you after the session. All right, so let's move on. Uh, we now we have Ms. Rahini Michaelik from the SBF who will be talking to everyone about the trading goods chapter, the rules of origin of the TRSFTA, as well as the operational certification procedure, all of which crucial to getting uh, to using the TRSFTA. Uh, Ms. Rahini, please. Thank you, Johan, for the introduction. Okay, so thanks to Johan for the introduction and also um, Denise and Jalisa for actually setting the ground on the overview of um, GRSFTA. So uh, for today's session, I'll be sharing with you on the trade and goods chapter, rules of origin and the operational certification procedure for um, Turkey Singapore FTA. So let me move on to my first slide. Okay, so um, like Jalisa mentioned just now, GRSFTA has been in force since um, 2017. So upon the full elimination, uh, implementation in 2027, the agreement will eliminate 95% um, of tariffs for Singapore exports to Turkey. So this agreement will also reduce the cost of burden for businesses exporting to Turkey and allow goods to be more price competitive compared to other foreign firms. So let me, um, next slide please. Let me um, use this scale to explain how um, FTAs can help reduce uh, costs for businesses. On the um, right side of the scale, you can see that these are the costs that um, importers incur when sourcing the product domestically or internationally without any FTAs in place. 
So if the product is sourced overseas, there may be duties imposed and these duties are collected by the customs authority in the importing country. So referring to the scale, causes like excise taxes, sales tax of VAT or GST that imposed for local or foreign produced goods. Um, for customs duties, it's only imposed on um, foreign produced goods. So um, sales tax and VAT are imposed for local and foreign produced goods. So this is where um, FTAs can come in or TRS FTA will come in. They can help to reduce or eliminate these customs or import duties and allow your product to have competitive pricing in the local market. So um, next slide. Using um, this um, example, we, I will explain to you further on how you can have tariff savings. So if you're exporting um, soy sauce from Singapore to Turkey, the HS code of 2103.10. So without any FTAs in place, the MFN rate is 7.7%. So when we're talking about MFN rate, we're referring to the most favoured nation rate. It's the tariffs that um, countries impose on imports from other members of the World Trade Organization. So if you're exporting about 500,000 worth of soy sauce, you have to pay customs duties of 38,500. So as you can see, this will not allow you to have any tariff savings. So if you're utilizing um, TRSFTA, the preferential rate will actually be at 0%, which means that you can actually have your customs duty eliminated and you're able to save 38,500 for $500,000 worth of soy sauce. But please do take note that your product still needs to meet the product specific rule to qualify for the preferential um, tariff rates. Uh, next slide, please. So um, apart from the cost benefits, TRSFTA also um, governs non-tariff related measures to better facilitate the trade process. So some of it is um, imposing disciplines to prevent both parties from restricting the importation or exportation of any good, um, requiring both parties to publish relevant information relating to import and export procedures on public sources, and also ensuring that the fees and formalities connected with importation and exportation are limited to only the cost of services rendered. So example will be fees needed to document or certify shipment of goods. Next slide. Okay, so I will provide a broad overview on the rules of origin, ROO, as it's important that you know your product will need to meet the ROO before you're able to obtain um, preferential tariff rates. So for rules of origin, there are rules that determine if your product is originating as this, as it is only these products that upon implementation into Turkey will have their import duties um, eliminated or reduced. This, this unlocking of cherry savings makes the product more price competitive and this is cheaper pricing could allow for increase in business for you. So it's important and vital that you're aware of how your good can actually qualify as an originating product and what are the documents that you will need to prove the origin status. So I'll move on to my next slide where I'll explain more about the rules of origin for TRSFTA. So um, how can you actually tell if your good is originating? There are two broad categories on the screen that you can refer to. One is um, goods that are wholly obtained or produced in Singapore or Turkey. Examples would be plants, vegetables or animals that are grown and harvested locally. The other um, category would be that goods have undergone substantial transformation either in Singapore or Turkey. So a good will be substantially transformed when it actually meets the product specific rules found under protocol one of TRSFTA, which means that there are no general rules for the goods to meet. Each good will have to meet a specific rule before being considered as originating. Next slide, please. So um, in the previous slide, I mentioned substantial transforming. So what is actually considered as insufficient uh, working or processing will be the examples on this slide. So things like breaking up and assembly of packages, um, simple mixing and uh, peeling of fruit, um, like coloring to your products or vegetables, will, these will all be considered um, insufficient working or processing and will not be able to meet the product specific rules of TRSFTA. 
Next slide. So, um, moving on to goods that have substantially transformed, there are actually three ways to determine origin criteria. So, the first way is through regional value content. So, this rule requires a certain percentage of the goods value to originate from the party of the FTA for the good to be considered originating. Let me explain to you further with an example. So, um, if you have turbo propeller parts, the HS code of 84191, it can be considered originating if the value of the non-originating materials used to manufacture in the product does not exceed 50% of the X works price. This means, right, that the originating materials used in the production of the turbo propeller parts needs to exceed 50%. So how do we actually calculate the regional value content is by two methods. One is the build-up method and the build-down method. The formulas are actually uh, shown on the slide. Okay, so for next slide, in this slide, you will actually see how um, we calculate the regional value content using the turbo propeller part example. So for um, this example, I'll be using the build-up method. The formula will be the value of originating materials plus the direct labor cost plus the direct overhead cost plus the profit divided by the X work price times 100%. So um, using the figures provided on the left hand side, the value content will be um, 69.64. So in the case of the turbo propeller parts, you will actually meet the product specific rule of the originating material exceeding 50% of the X works price. I will move on to the um, next rule, which will be um, change in tariff classification. So for this rule, it's only applicable for non-originating materials, which means your HS code of your non-originating materials cannot have the same HS classification as your final good. So um, below I have um, categorized um, three HS classification that you can refer to. One is um, change in chapter which refers to the first two digits of the HS code. As you can see in the example, the first two digits of the HS code for coconut oil, 08, is not the same as the first two digits of the HS code coconut oil. This means there has been a change of tariff, tariff classification, or in this case, change in chapter. For the next example, it will be change in heading, which refers to the first four digits of the HS code. So for the tomatoes used in the production of tomato sauce, it does not have the same HS code as the final good, which is the tomato sauce. So you can see there has been a change in the first four digits. For the last example, is um change in subheading, referring to the first six digit of the HS code. As you can see from the example, um, from pineapples, the HS code 0804.30, it does not have the same first six digits as cayenne pineapples, HS code 2008.20. So moving on to the next slide, I'll explain it in the context of um, TRSFTA. So for example, if your company is exporting tropical fruit jam with the HS code of 2007.10.91 to Turkey from Singapore, the rules of origin state that it needs to have a change in heading to be considered originating. Um, change in heading, as mentioned in the previous slide, refers to the first four digits. I've actually listed the raw materials and the HS code on the table. As you can refer, the yellow highlighted fields, um, both sugar and preservatives are non-originating materials as they are not from Turkey or Singapore. So these two HS codes cannot have the same first four digits as the final goods. So um, I would like to add on that the since um for Turkey, most of the products actually have to meet the product specific rule. There's actually an additional rule that the tropical fruit jam has to uh, meet, which is the weight of the sugar in the final product cannot exceed twenty percent of the final um the weight of the final product. So it has to meet the change in heading and also the sugar rule. So it's important to note take note for foods like. Um, for products like food and textiles, there might be additional rules for you to meet uh, to be considered originating. So the last rule is the process rule. This rule is more applicable for chemical goods 
uh, that need to undergo specific chemical processing to be considered originating. An example will be fuel oils. They have to undergo a specific process like refining, distillation, or chemical processing to be considered originating. Next slide. So, um, Jalison previously mentioned just now about um, Asian food products. So, TRSFT does have this special provision for Asian food products that the tariffs will be eliminated, provided that the goods actually meet the product specific rule of GRSFTA. So, the list of Asian food products can be found on Appendix 2A3 of TRSFTA. And um, we'll be sharing around the link with you after this webinar so you can refer to the full list. Um, some examples will actually include um, hakao, lobster flavor balls, and um, canned luncheon meat. Next slide. So I'll be moving on to the operational certification procedure for TRSFTA. They have actually adopted a sales declaration um, regime, which means that the businesses can declare the origin of their product on commercial documents without having to apply for a PCO with Singapore Customs. This actually helps businesses to save administrative time and cost. The origin declaration needs to contain the text and details set out in Annex E under Protocol 1 of the TRSFC legal text, and it must also describe the goods in sufficient detail so that the importing customs will be able to identify the goods. So next slide, you can actually see the screenshot of the origin declaration that I snipped out from the Annex E of TR TRSFTA. So as an exporter, you will need to submit this declaration together with your commercial invoice. Next slide. So to actually sum up the whole um, self-declaration regime, your step one will be that the exporter will have to make the self-assessment that the goods meet the product-specific rules of TRSFTA. And step two will be the exporter will have to make proper declaration using the text of origin declaration on any commercial document confirming that the goods actually meet the product specific rule. And step three will be that the importer will make the preferential tariff claim based on the exporter's um, self-declaration. So next slide, I'll be sharing the documentation for TRSFTA. So if the exporter is making out the origin declaration, they will need to keep a copy for at least three years from the date of the origin declaration was made out. Together with the declaration, you will also have to keep the below mentioned document. So um, best practice is actually to um, keep documents for at least five years as per Singapore's domestic law. And the importing customs will actually uh, keep the declaration for at least three years. Next slide. So there are some exemptions from um, origin where um, the exporter or the company did not doesn't need to complete the origin declaration. So for example, if there's small packages, they can be considered originating without the submission of um, origin declaration. So this value of the small packages cannot exceed 500 euro. And for packages as part of traveler's personal luggage, it cannot exceed um, 1,200 euro to be exempted from the origin declaration. Okay, so um, as uh, I would also like to share with you on the um, Cherry Finder. So Cherry Finder is actually a tool, a uh, complementary tool um, created by Enterprise Singapore and Mandel for specifically for Singapore companies to actually find um, answers on tariff and non-tariff um, trade measures. So there are actually four modules on the Cherry Finder that you can see on the screen. So um, first module, um, is on nomenclatures, which um, is to search for your product's HS code. So um, using the Cherry Finder, you can um, search for your product's HS code with the list provided. So you can also check the applicable tariffs and the rules of origin or product-specific rules for your products. So the second module is tariff and taxes. So this Two, the Tariff Finder 2 actually provides um, information on the tariff and taxes applicable for your product. So in the starting of the slides, I mentioned um, tax, uh, excise duties, VATs, and GST. So you will be able to see those duties applicable for your product on the Tariff Finder as well. Just to um, repeat again, FT does not eliminate um, the local taxes. The local um, 
it will only eliminate uh, importing duties. So for the third module, you can get information on the rules of origin or um, product specific rules applicable to your product. And then the last module is import formalities. So this section provides you high level information on certain rules or documentation needed for the country that you're importing to. Next slide. So how you can um, actually access the tariff finder, you can head on to www.fta.gov.sg or actually scan the QR code given on the screen. So once you reach um, the website, you can actually um, scroll down and click on the tariff finder link and it will lead you directly to the tariff finder page. So all you have to do is register for a complimentary account using your company's VN and corporate email address. There are no um, limit on the number of accounts each company can create, so you don't need to share an account with your colleague. Uh, next slide. Okay, so once your account has been activated, you can use the tool to find out about tariff and um, non-tariff information. If you have any questions about um, how to use the tariff finder, you can always drop us an email at sda.org. At so moving on to the next slide, I would like to share some FTA resources with you guys. So the first one will be the legal site for Singapore's FTA. So here we'll be able to find um, the legal site of every FTA that um, Singapore um, has. And then the next one will be the FTA and TA booklet from um, MTI. So you have, will have information on the different FTAs and DTAs that Singapore has signed. Um, next slide will be um, the updates by Singapore Customs. So you'll get the latest updates using the circulars from the Singapore Customs website. Um, the next resource will be um, Trade in Goods Guidebook that um, SPF has actually work together with a vendor to um, create. So you can actually um, read through the booklet to find out more information about other um, trade and goods um, chapter. So um, we also have an FTA mailing list that you can actually join to learn more about um, um, SBF organized FTA uh, events and workshop. And we have an ASEAN guidebook on services coming soon. So please um, keep a lookout for that. And lastly, for any questions on FTAs or related issues, you can always email us at FTA at sbf.org.sg. So that's all for my sharing. I'll pass my time now to Johan. Thank you, Rahini. Certainly very insightful. Uh, now let's move on to the last segment of our day with uh, Mr. Ian Lee, Mr. Jem Karchi, as well as Mr. Amre Yokilic. Uh, Mr. Ian Lee, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rosan. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good night, Dun, um, to, to my Turkish friends. And for, for all your listening in, actually, today you're all in a very uh, beneficial uh, location. You're listening in to, to key aspects of why you need to invest in Turkey, why you need to do business with Turkey. Eh? Okay. Um, you hear from the FTA, from the three speakers uh, before, that um, the FTA covers trade as well as investments. We've got two people lined up here, uh, key, key big, uh, personnel, uh, Mr. Kasi, uh, Mr. Sam Kasi from uh, Straits Marine. Uh, he's been many years doing trading between Singapore and, and Turkey. Eh? You can hear from his experience of uh, uh, his training before and after using FTA. We also have uh, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, he's uh, with uh, the Invest in Turkey. Uh, he's actually based in Singapore. Actually, both of them are based in Singapore, but they are traveling now. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ahmed, uh, thank you. You got to wake up so early just to, to do this presentation. But for your listening in, okay, you must understand where Turkey sits is very strategic and where and what are things going on there. The lira has dropped in the past few weeks. The Turkey has gone the a new presidential election. Um, new cabinet ministers have, have been appointed, which is key for you all, is beneficial for you all. You got a list. If you don't know, we can ask, talk about it after this 11 o'clock session. I think I believe I exceeded my time. And also the Ukraine-Russia war and where Turkey is, it's, this is the time, the window for you to do business. Okay. Next year, your strategy may need to change. We'll talk about that later. But now let's let's listen. Why? Why Turkey? So, uh, Mr. Ahmed, can you share with us what is the strategic value proposition for our listeners here today? Okay, 
that you should take take note of okay uh, about your country please mr uh, a very good morning to everyone First of all, let me just introduce myself. I'm representing the Turkish Investment Office, which you can think like the counterpart of the Singapore's Economic Development Board. I'm based in Singapore, yes, for the last five years, and I'm covering the region as the chief representative. And thanks for organizing this wonderful session. I first remember the, you know, five years ago, the first uh, Singapore-Turkey free trade agreement outreach sessions and throughout those years, uh, we have enlarged our network and now both uh, like entrepreneurs from both countries are able to tap on many opportunities. Yeah, just to, you know, referring to your question, uh, Ian, I think uh, we should uh, better identify the value proposition of uh, Turkey. Eh? By the way, feel, please feel free to keep saying Turkey because which was the way we got used to call our uh, country, but never mind, uh, it's still being used, but it's officially just uh, revised as uh, Turkey as a more proper way uh, of the naming. So, I mean, uh, what are the you know, uh, advantages of uh, doing business in Turkey, not necessarily uh, investing or uh, expanding or like uh, making doing an uh, acquisition, but you know, starting your uh, operations across Turkey for a regional coverage or for a domestic market focused operations. There are eight major, I think, components of that particular matter, which we can start with the strategic location as we all have been speaking about the, you know, a very central uh, location. But this is, I think, being uh, proven by the operations of the major uh, conglomerates, which you can see hereby, uh, you know, all the way from uh, OEM manufacturers to the some service companies, they're managing uh, like a, several countries from their Istanbul or you know nearby headquarters and uh, you can also have access to you know almost a billion uh, consumer base with uh, thanks to the uh, our like a customs union with the European Union and as well as the uh, 24 other free trade agreements on top of the uh, FTA with uh, Singapore so I mean this has been achieved uh, thanks to the, I think, robust uh, logistics infrastructure in the country. Throughout the last, again, uh, 20 over years, uh, we can see like, uh, like a major infrastructure works being done and the uh, trades uh, and investment channels has been created between uh, you know global stakeholders and as you can see number of airports high-speed railways and maritime sites also thanks to the uh, Singapore's uh, PSA as they have been operating uh, the largest container or terminal in the southern uh, coast of uh, Turkey, uh, where they handle like 3 million over TU capacity, uh, we have reached a certain capacity of uh, maritime transportation. And uh, when we look at the, you know, Turkey, uh, I think this is uh, not necessarily, you, you just need to focus on the names, but just take a look at the picture because Turkey is a large country where we see like 81 provinces. It takes like a, almost two hours to travel all the way from West to the uh, most Eastern part of the country. And there are several, you know, logistics centers and uh, like a, some sort of, ongoing uh, infrastructure works again. So um, this is just again a benchmark table uh, with the other Europe, Central Asia and OECD countries where we stand uh, kind of a you know, more competitive uh, market. So, uh, I mean, just in the beginning of the uh, session, Denise has just mentioned about some uh, promising sectors. Yes, there is a diversified um, sectoral base in Turkey, all the way from automotive to the till, uh, like uh, agri food as a traditional sector and uh, finance. I've just seen a you know question in the uh, panel uh, to the panelists, like about the newly launched Istanbul Financial Center, which we can uh, speak later on. So, I mean, how 
is that being done? Actually, Turkey has always been on a transition from a you know commodity-based country to a more like an advanced uh, manufacturing uh, journey. Yet we are still uh, kind of you know progressing and trying to catch up with the more advanced uh, countries. But uh, we are now, uh, I think, uh, growing our uh, like a like, I mean, the profile of our uh, outputs and also the more sophisticated services. Again, with this slide, you can see the uh, intensity of the uh, kind of uh, our outputs has been, uh, have been uh, on an advancing uh, trend. I mean, this has been done also thanks to the uh, several incentives, which is more or less similar to the global uh, incentive outlook where you can find all the tax and employment related uh, exemptions. Uh, but I think more specifically, we should uh, elaborate on the R&D specific incentives where you can have the, you know, almost like a zero liability uh, kind of operating uh, scheme, uh, all the corporate income taxes and the uh, employment related taxes are being exempted. And again, uh, when we look at the you know industrial uh, clusters across uh, Turkish industrial zones, where we have, I mean, there are 325 like industrial parks in Turkey, on top of the 84 techno parks designated areas, and those techno parks are some of them are just in the middle of the city. Just you know, imagine there is a NUS operated techno park in the CBD or a SMU operated techno park in the CBD area of Singapore. So this is where you can uh, set up your business and run smoothly. And there's there are also like 18 free zones where also Singaporean companies are also operating like on the petrochemicals and plastics industries. And also uh, like uh, agri-food giants like Olam uh, have been operating in those industrial parks with uh, several facilities across uh, you know, uh, several regions in Turkey. So when we look at the uh, labor again outlook, Turkey is standing uh, somewhere between uh, like uh, China, Mexico uh, in terms of the availability and as well as the cost. Uh, this is like, a, you know, uh, IMD world competitiveness from uh, like, a, you know, global data. And again, uh, lastly, uh, when we look at the, you know, uh, kind of the Turkey's uh, outlook on the openness to the uh, foreign direct investments and the, you know, uh, establishment of the uh, global companies, local subsidiaries, we have gone so far and the number of days have been uh, dropping and uh, the, you know, indexes showing Turkey is on a more uh, positive uh, track. So uh, I think uh, last thing uh, maybe I should just uh, mention about the uh, about some companies uh, in the you know uh, taking advantage of this like growing ecosystem because again in the beginning it's been mentioned that there are some very uh, solid. Uh, collaborations in the tech scene. Uh, I think you can see my uh, slide, right? So this is uh, another uh, presentation. So maybe I should just uh, mention about that one lastly and finish my part. So there, there has been a number of companies, as you can see, and amongst them, there are like Turkish companies with some Singapore headquarters become a unicorn. And even like some Turk, uh, Singapore based venture capitalists have just, you know, um, invested into some Turkish uh, startup companies and some Singapore headquartered global tech giants utilizing Turkey as a uh, regional, uh, again, office, Istanbul offices. Uh, yeah, that's more or less, I think, uh, the kind of outlook from our side and happy to address any questions uh, may arise. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Um, from all that you have presented, I think from all the 44 over countries in Europe, I've never seen such a very promising um, opportunity for all of Singapore companies. So for all you all listening in now, okay, I, I think this, this Turkey is, is one of the best, better uh, 
location that you all should consider doing business in. Huh? So that, that's um, from uh, Mr. Ahmed. Okay, uh, we'll come back to you. Uh, if we will see the questions, yeah. So um, now we we we'll, uh, we we'll, we'll talk with uh, Mr. Kasi. Yeah, Mr. Kasi, he's from um, Straits Marine. Uh, he's been in Singapore for quite a while. But uh, Mr. Kasi, can, can you share with us uh, um, what does your company Straits Marine uh, do in Singapore? How many years have you all been operating here in Singapore? Actually, because um, your experience in trade uh, between Singapore and Turkey is, is what some of our our participants here would like to to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the such a nice organization and in, in, in inviting me. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is James Karji, and then the, over 20 years we are running Straits Marine, one of the our uh, shipping arm company uh, in Singapore, and we established in 2003 the Straits Marine for the marine sector uh, supply and services needs to provide to our worldwide customer. And as a part of our business, we do do import and export from to Singapore. And uh, Turkey also, Turkey also one of the, the uh, uh, main source and then the customers for the, the import and export. So we, our main company is established in Singapore 1993. We have uh, over 30 years experience in Singapore, trading all around the world and then they're with Turkey as well. And um, how I can describe to the, the Turkey, well, I was impressed when I first, uh, when I hear first time, there's the great junction like Singapore, uh, quite big similarities for the, because we are in the marine sector, which means the, the logistic hub, in the world, one of the, one of the main uh, logistic hub. Turkey also the, the similarities for the uh, sea freight, uh, air freight, as well as land freight, which we don't have in Singapore much. So they have it for north to east or the west to uh, east or uh, north to south, uh, great junction uh, over there for business, for commercial, uh, geographical, and culturally is the great junction. And the, our company also tried to use this opportunity to, to sell and then the, buy some products from Turkey. So uh, over 20 years, what we did actually at the beginning, of course, not, uh, it was not easy uh, as now to sell or to get the, 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 the products. Uh, thanks for both sides governments and then the uh, other people who make it easier for the all uh, the, the traders or the, the companies like us to make it smooth and better business. And uh, as I said, the, the, we serve in the, the mainly aviation and marine sector in Singapore. Uh, we usually buy some products from the Turkey, mainly food food related products, but we the, we do sell to Turkey and through Turkey the more. Uh, mechanical, industrial, spare parts, machinery, engineering things. Okay, so so when you buy and you sell uh, from Singapore and Turkey, um, I believe you have done this before the FTA came into effect, and also you've been doing it after the FTA came into effect. Can you share with us um, what what are the, uh, your experience uh, now that the FTA is in effect? Um, how have you um, benefited in any ways? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a good point. And then FTA is, although it's uh, 2017 is implemented, but you know, the, we had the, the great two last two years uh, point <laughs> negative effect. That's why uh, we we get the, the quite benefits from the, the for the this uh, free trade agreements between both countries, which make us the, the much more easier for the procedure to. Mm especially sell the, the products or service mm. to, through the Turkey or to Turkey okay. side, and yeah. uh, which I uh, highlight uh, here. Uh, for importing also, it's uh, some business, but Singapore's uh, regulation and standard is uh, pretty good. And then the, except few points, maybe I will mention a little bit, then maybe you will help us to, to improve the Singapore side as well. That mm -hmm. point. And uh, it's uh, comparing to the before FTA and the after, uh, especially for the export from Singapore to, to Turkey, getting much easier. Okay. Uh, I mean, practically, I'm saying, 
uh, numbers, all our friends uh, shared the numbers. I, I believe that it will increase in the, the future, all the numbers and uh, the both side important exports. But <clears throat> operationally, practically for the business wise is that much more promising and much more easier for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's yeah. smoother for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, correct. And uh, what I wanted to highlight, of course, the both sides, um, I don't want to point any of the government or the, the government organization, but uh, still there is a way to improve for both sides. <laughs> for Singapore side, we need to improve the, the some procedure here internally. Uh, all the free trade, uh, free trade agreement is make it more easier. But after that, also, also some of the very slow processing in Singapore, mm -hmm. we need to uh, eliminate or to make yeah. it faster, uh, such as the, the SFA procedures, et cetera, and at least timing and then processing. And in Turkey side also, we need to be careful for the, if we export anything over there, uh, for the custom formalities, mm -hmm. uh, for the products or the industrial, need to be careful and then need to find the good partners over there to assist, guide you, which I recommend for the, if any other company is willing to do the, some business over there. Yeah. And uh, other than that, actually, the, due to the, this COVID period, actually we slow down and almost uh, stop the, yeah. some of the, the areas, but uh, since uh, end of last year, it's the it's started. I mean, resumed the, the business much faster. Okay, and, uh, I'm expecting to to get much better result for our companies and then for other companies also okay. in the near future. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So yeah. uh, for your listening in, uh, take note what uh, Mr. Kasi has uh, shared that um, uh, if you're importing food, especially right, um, some of the food products uh, in Singapore, the FS SFA uh, got to hasten the the approval process, right? Uh, MTI, I believe they are listening in, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but what he shared also is that uh, for your listening is that when you uh, export goods from Singapore into Turkey, the paperwork is smoother, correct, Mr. Kasi? Yes, yes. You experience after comparing the FTA. to before FTA, correct. So, so it's very good experience. So you're, mm -hmm. you're listening in, please take advantage of this, okay? When you go to Turkey with your goods, very easy, okay? Now after the FTA, yeah? Okay, so one, one last point, uh, Mr. Kasi, um, for all our listeners here today, um, what, what other uh, advice that you can give to our, our listeners, the businessmen that's listening in here uh, about the, um, this FTA, about any other business opportunity uh, that Singapore companies should consider uh, in, in the Turkey market? Okay, what I wanted to highlight, you a little bit touch at the beginning uh, for the, the Tur Turkey position and economical and then the political things that, that which is happening for the Ukraine, Russia, mm -hmm. oh, and then I hope it will end it soon. And uh, uh, this is also economically, uh, there's a, some potential between Singapore and the Turkey. And uh, as you mentioned about the, the politically also the, the new government established, I believe that they will do much better for the foreign trade for both countries, both uh, governments. And then the, there is a the huge opportunity because uh, Sing uh, Turkey also is another uh, assembly or the manufacturing point for the Western part or the for mm -hmm. Middle East and then Africa. That's why I recommend all Singapore companies also to use this opportunity to use the Turkey as yeah. a step to the goal yes. further points for the yeah. yeah okay I think that's a that's a very good advice uh, for your listening yeah. in businessmen use Turkey find good partners which uh, Mr Emery uh, Mr Ahmed will, will be able to help you to find right uh, yeah. and use Turkey to establish your foothold to go into Europe okay especially now the government is new the the war in Ukraine and, and, and Russia will have a lot more opportunity for your goods and services from Singapore. But to go direct there is difficult. Use Turkey as a landing point, right? Yeah, so exactly. I think it's a good advice. Yeah. Um, Mr. Ahmad, anything else to add before we conclude this uh, panel session? 
just for that, you know, last point that you have made, there has been concrete cases we have seen. Yes, I mean, one of the you know, companies that I have shown, like, uh, you know, a cybersecurity unicorn with a Singapore headquarters, Acronis has just relocated 120 over, you know, engineers from their Moscow office to Istanbul uh, recently. I mean, this, I think, shows kind of a resilience point uh, in Turkey where we played kind of a critical role to make the business as usual uh, between uh, this ongoing uh, conflict in the region. And uh, I think uh, many others can follow, follow that path, not necessarily with a big, again, uh, scales. And uh, just uh, you know, as a final remark, this is the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic. So we are about to uh, celebrate this occasion with some upcoming uh, kind of uh, special arrangements. Hopefully uh, we are going to host uh, kind of a, like a senior management with the, uh, within July uh, with the 100th anniversary uh, reception. And uh, you know, then the, the, the other uh, special occasions will follow that and I'd like to just thank all the uh, participants and the organizers for that wonderful session once again. Thank you, thank you Mr. Ahmed. Yeah, we definitely wait for your celebration and we'll all join in. Okay, uh, thank you also uh, Mr. Kasi for, for sharing with us. Okay, uh, uh, Johan, back to you for Q&A. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you so much Mr. Ian Lee, Mr. Tim Karchi as well as Mr. Emre. Now, uh, I think we have run out of time because uh, everything was a bit uh, longer than I expected, but no worries, all for the good details and information. Uh, before we end uh, the session, let us, uh, I will be launching uh, at the end of webinar poll. We would truly appreciate everyone's feedback on the webinar, how we can improve and how we can make it better for everyone in the future. Okay. Now, uh, so as I mentioned, unfortunately, we do not have enough time to hold the Q&A, but do not worry. All questions will be replied to directly via your email address. Uh, for all uh, participants who are concerned, the slides, will be sorry, the slides will be shared to you as well. So please hang on. Uh, it will be shared to you by the end of the week. Okay. Uh, Okay, and then that's it. Uh, does anyone else have any questions from the panelists? I um, just want to check in if any of the panelists have any um, last words about um, GRSFTA or anything um, you guys want to share with the participants as well before they exit the webinar. Um, hi, thanks very much. It's Denise here again from MTI. Just to um, thank everybody for sharing. I think that was very useful information and some of the feedback with regard to uh, what you mentioned, SFA. And we have some questions coming in on the chat on uh, products that are categorized under HSA versus SFA leading certain certification. Very real and tangible problems and challenges, issues that you um, people are facing. We're very happy to see how we can work together on things like this. I know there's not enough time here to go into it and Anyway, we would need certain details to be exchanged between us to help certain situations. So if we could trouble um, SBF maybe as the contact point to filter people to us. I've given on the chat um, uh, in response to one of the questions with regard to certification, uh, my email address and Jalisa's email address. But I don't think everyone would have received it. And if I could just trouble you to, if there are questions and everything else that need to be channeled to us, very happy uh, to take that on with whoever is asking. So if you could trouble SBF to uh, kind of uh, channel that to us, that would be very helpful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely we will uh, direct any questions to you. Okay, thanks very right. much. Uh, yeah. We have come to the end of the session. Thank you so much, all speakers, Ms. Denise, Ms. Jalisa, Ms. Rahini, Mr. Lee, Mr. Bujokic, and Mr. Karachi for all your time and effort. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating and taking time off to attend this webinar. And uh, have a good day ahead. Stay safe. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.